trust that everyone has recovered from a splendid lunch and an excellent presentation by Olivia, which I have to confess, even from my own perspective, was significantly more optimistic than I'd anticipated, having seen the outcomes from Bali. We're going to try and tackle this afternoon the dimension that was said at the end of the second of the economic sessions this morning had been left out of the debate. The whole question of migration and its impact on policies. And for the purpose of our discussion this afternoon, we're looking at it from two dimensions, a European perspective and a perspective from the United States. These are very different, but both have manifested in a much sharper way in the course of the last five or six years for reasons that we all understand. Let's just very briefly try and frame the issue. The latest global migration report of the IOM indicates that there are about 244 million international migrants in 2015, which is the last year for which they have authoritative figures. Now, that is in addition to another 741 million internally displaced persons or migrants within their own countries. So in simple terms, about a billion people are in fact moving around at the present time. That trend, that tendency seems likely to increase, firstly because of levels of geopolitical instability, present uncertainty, gaps between circumstances, economic and otherwise, in the developing and the developed world, and then on top of that, the uncertain impacts of climate change on significant parts of the developing world. So this challenge of migration, which has already produced significant political consequences, is unlikely to go away. And developing some sort of coherent sense of how to manage it effectively has already engaged the attention of the international community with a desire to create a global treaty on migration as well as a separate treaty on refugees uh, in the course of 2018. That seems unlikely to be realized in a satisfactory manner at present, but nonetheless, that's the frame of where we are. Now, we have on the panel this afternoon an extraordinarily knowledgeable and skilled group of people capable of addressing this issue. In good form, I'm not going to read out their bios. You have the biography booklets. But we have, from my left to my right, Jean-Francois Coupier, who was, of course, mayor of Mur in France, a lecturer at Sciences Po and associate professor at the University of Paris 8. We have Jim Hoagland, who is a consulting and contributing editor to Washington Post since 2010, having been associate editor and chief correspondent for decades before that. We have Bogdan Klitsch, the uh, minority leader of the Polish Senate, who has also served as Minister of Defense until 2011. And we have Laszlo Troczanyi, who is Minister of Justice in Hungary since 2014, and is a lawyer by profession, a head of the faculty and professor of law at a university in Hungary as well. So a variety of different perspectives, a variety of different insights, and great experience. Jean-Francois, if I can turn to you first to set the scene for us, what is your perspective on it? Well, first of all, to make it very clear, I think what is at stake is the fact that for years and years and probably decades, the main divide was between center-right and center-left parties. And I think that the, what is new today and what is at stake is that if you have a look to the politic deal the political deal in democracies today, the divide is between populist and traditional government parties. And this is very dangerous because what is at stake now, it's the capacity for democracies to face this kind of problem because the main battlefield is, of course, the issue of immigration, like you just said. And according to me, we cannot we cannot um, move forward in this question if we, don't, if we forget that if it is a problem today, it's because of the incapacity of the democratic countries in Europe to integrate successfully 
all these people coming from many other countries with their own culture, tradition, history, and religion. And this is exactly what is at stake today. And if things are very difficult, it's because first the way of ideology, which is as, as usual very manichaeist between the one that are supposed to be very humanist and the other one which uh, we are supposed to be very uh, nationalist. I think this is an interesting debate for elections, but not for concrete action. And what is at stake for us as regular, traditional um, government parties is to show that we are able to challenge this, pro this problem and to face it. And we have to face it as a national and a European scale, both. Which is to say, and I would just give some reflection for all of you. First thing, as a European point of view, to harmonize the question. Because, of course, there is not in one side the nice, lucid, um, Hungarian and Polish countries who knows everything about the question, and in the other side, French or Great Britain or Italy, well, let's put Italy away now, Germany, uh, who are very humanist and naive. This is not the question which is on the table. The question is that we don't have to face the same kind of problems because the immigrants are passing through Hungary, but then they are never staying in Hungary. And you have probably your point of view on this point. So we have to harmonize the analysis and to see how we can do it again together. The second point is to control the European borders. And this is a European problem and not a state member problem. And then the third thing is internal legislation. Big part of the problem is a national problem. The fact that in France we are unable to give very quick answer, administrative answer, to the asylum claimers is one of the major problems. We need to give an answer in two months, and today it's two years, three years, four years, then the families are settling and they are totally lost. The second thing is for all the people who are not eligible to the asylum right, they don't have any reason to stay in our countries because it, it's economic, Migration, we don't have the tools to be successful for their uh, integration in Europe. And then, it's my last word, we have a big question, which is never evocated as I'm doing now. It's the question of multiculturalism, which is the title of our panel. On this precise point, I would like to say something. Until the Second World War, especially in Europe, Specifically in France, we had a model which was name is assimilation. The English said aggressive assimilation, which is not the good word. We're not aggressive. But at that time, when you were migrating in France, you were choosing French name, speaking French without any accent. The tradition, the religion was at home. When you were in the public space, you were totally adopting the French Republican values. After the 60s, we have totally abandoned this model of assimilation to the multicultural one, which is to say everybody has his own culture and the, local, the, the original culture from abroad is a culture that can prevail over the common laws of the country that welcome you. And this was the beginning of the problems, especially when you add to it the religious problem and, of course, the, the, the rising of the uh, Muslim uh, radical Islamist influence is today very present in our debates, again in the question of the, of the burqa, because you have maybe heard about what happened in the Na United Nations this week, uh, the uh, position of uh, committee of the Na United Nations against France, and the law that I have personally passed as a congressman to, f to ban the wearing of burqa, which is totally opposed to the French Republican laws and the way we respect the rights for women. This kind of question shows how it's difficult for traditional parties who want to lead the country, who want to act, to give structural answers to the populist and extremist parties. So what, this is exactly what is at stake today, and we have to give answers because if we don't, it will be too late in a short while. Thank you, Jean-Francois.
Laszlo, I'm going to come directly to you on that for two reasons. One is because Jean-Francois has posed this as a European challenge and has recognized the in diversity of individual circumstance among different states within the European landscape. Um, so I'd very much like to hear your perspective on this. Uh, vous voulez parler français, je pense? Je parle bon français. C'est bon. Euh, Monsieur le Président, alors quand nous parlons de multiculturalisme sur ce sujet, il faut que je commence avec une, comment dirais-je, une phrase de Chantal Delson. Chantal Delson a écrit que les frontières signifient d'abord l'existence d'une société qui se trouve à l'intérieur. Ça signifie quand même qu'il faut qu'on parle de multiculturalisme, et de réfugiés, et de l'immigration. Alors il faut parler des sociétés. Et je parle aussi de la société hongroise. Alors je pense que c'est très important de prendre en considération la théorie de cercle de responsabilité. Alors pour nous, en Europe centrale, pour nous, il y a un certain sentiment de responsabilité qui est très fort envers le pays de Balkans. Quand il y avait la guerre en Yougoslavie, alors quand même, l'hospitalité de la Hongrie était tout à fait bien connue. Il y a 40 000 personnes qui sont arrivées sur notre territoire. Je comprends bien que, quand même, la Belgique a plus de responsabilités envers le Congo que, par exemple, le Burkina Faso. Pour la France, il y a plus de responsabilités pour le Burkina Faso que Angola. Ça signifie que le feeling de responsabilité dans la société, c'est un élément très important quand nous parlons élément de la migration. Parce que la migration arrive, mais après, il faut regarder la société où arrivent les gens. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle c'est très important pour moi personnellement, la, fini, la feeling de responsabilité. Et la question se pose qu'en Europe centrale, est-ce qu'il y a le même feeling de responsabilité qu'en Europe occidentale Et permettez-moi que je parle ouvertement. Alors ça signifie que quand nous regardons en Europe centrale, qui était toujours fermée pendant 40 ans, 45 ans, avec le rideau fer, alors qu'est-ce que nous regardons il y avait déstabilisation des régions. Quelle question se pose qu Est-ce que l'Europe centrale, la responsabilité de l'Europe centrale, la déstabilisation de différentes régions, qui est quand même un élément facto Deuxièmement, alors aussi, il faut que je veuille aussi que euh, l'export de la démocratie, cet élément aussi, à mon avis, c'est très important. Est-ce que la feeling en Europe centrale, est-ce que nous avons participé dans l'export de la démocratie dans les régions déstabilisées Nous n'avons pas su le certain. Et le troisième élément, permettez que je vous dise aussi que quand même, euh, peut-être les anciens empires coloniaux n'ont pas été suffisamment sensibles à la juste redistribution des richesses créées durant les périodes de 30 de glorieuses années. Alors ça signifie quand même qu'il faut regarder l'Europe centrale et la Hongrie dedans, et qu'en ce cas, nous voyons qu'il y a une, comment dire, une philosophie derrière les choses, comme nous voyons la migration aujourd'hui. Bien sûr, après, nous pouvons aller beaucoup plus loin de la réaction de, de gouvernement hongrois dans différents domaines. Alors, bien sûr que je peux parler plus tôt après autour de ça, mais je vais penser que je commence avec un élément que présenter le, comment dirais-je, comment nous regardons la migration, les causes de la migration et la sensibilité de l'Europe centrale. La solidarité, c'est très important que élément. Bien sûr, je peux parler après, mais je ne veux pas monopoliser euh, comment dire, je, euh, euh, le droit de parole, mais je voulais seulement exprimer que quand même en Europe centrale, la vue concernant la migration, c'est un peu différent que, par exemple, ailleurs en Europe. Merci beaucoup. Bogdan, je vais venir à vous. Vous allez parler plus généralement about the emergence of populism as a phenomenon in the European landscape, not least driven by this debate. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity because, uh, uh, first of all, it's good that we are speaking about the problems of uh, migration and populism here in Morocco, in a successful country, in a country that was able to accommodate more than 50,000 of uh, migrants from Sahel during the last uh, three years, and uh, was able to collaborate fruitfully with Spain and some other countries con concerning protection of European borders. This is the success story 
not only of Morocco, but also of Spain. And it can be an example of a good collaboration with partners of the European Union in our, in our neighborhood. That's first. Secondly, the problem of migration is one of the main reasons for expansion of populism in, uh, in Europe. And the government that the uh, uh, minister presents is a good example of this populist government that emerged in Central Europe that was known in the world during the last 25 years as a protector of democratic transition protector of European values, and even projected European and democratic values abroad. Now, in some countries of uh, Central Europe and some countries of Western Europe, we have a uh, re-emergence of uh, two um, very dangerous tendencies, political tendencies. This is populism and nationalism. And there are regions like Catalonia, for example, that uh, those uh, two tendencies uh, go uh, together uh, ahead, reinforcing each, uh, each other. Populism has the same sources. It is, uh, it is the convenience that uh, establishments were not ready to deal with uh, crucial issues in the European Union, migration as one of those issues uh, itself, but they create also major threats for uh, democratic systems and uh, reverses, and they reverse uh, uh, the tendency that was described by Schumpeter and Huntington as the third wave of uh, democratization. Maybe from the perspective of, uh, of uh, American foreign policy, it is not so so important, but American Freedom House in its project Nations in Transit uh, observed that in 2018, it was uh, the second year that uh, there were more consolidated authoritarian systems than consolidated democracies. And it underlines that among 29 countries, 19, 19 had noticed declines in the overall democratic uh, scores. Freedom House experts, of course, emphasized that illiberalism not uh, became the main tendency in 2017, but effects of illiberalism, what Viktor Orban presented as uh, a concept of illiberal democracy, they were, uh, they were visible two years ago, and one year ago so, so strongly. Uh, in Central Europe particularly, this uh, populism means that uh, the people can go to the protests. Yes, they can, they can do it. They can establish and conduct independent uh, NGOs. Yes, they can do it, but many of them, or even majority of them, are supported financially by the state. So, that, so they are not independent in traditional uh, approach. They, uh, people can publish critical articles in some of independent media. In Hungary, the sector of independent media is very limited, very limited. In Poland, fortunately, independent media exists still as an important uh, a, a partner for civil society, but people know in Hungary, Poland, and uh, some other countries that expressing themselves, they can have government inspections or attacks can, can be attacked in government uh, aligned media, or even they, they can be under discrimination in employment. I do not want to say that those tendencies are similar to those that uh, create the violent authorit authoritarianism in Eastern Europe, because what's going on in Russia and in uh, some other post-Soviet Republic is completely different shape. I want only to say that this, those tendencies visible in Central Europe are visible also 
in some countries in Western Europe in which populists uh, either win, are the one elections, or are ready to win elections. We can see the results of the German uh, election to Bundestag. 12.6% for AFD. In Bavaria, 12.4% for, for, for AFD. We can see ruling two parties in, uh, in Italy. They don't undermine the institutional framework of constitutional democratic regimes, but they can do it because the source of Western European and Central European populism is the same. Thank you very much. Right, you've heard three interesting perspectives across the European landscape. Jim Hoagland is here with two hats on, I think. One is he is an extremely knowledgeable commentator on matters pertaining to the world at large and has a great amount of experience of the European landscape. But he's also, by definition, a US citizen who operates essentially out of Washington, DC, and has a perspective on the world that has been changed quite considerably by Mr. Trump's election and a new focus on issues pertaining to migration in the United States as well. So, Jim, your view. Sean, I will gladly accept your invitation to put my hand on a very hot stove and see how long I can keep it there. Uh, because that's what discussing migration and populism today is. Because I think it's necessary, after having heard our friends from Central Europe, to ask a, a subsequent question, which is, is populism an effective answer to the problems of migration and the other aspects of globalization to which we're seeing a backlash, both in Europe and in the United States. Let's think about what globalization has been. It's been the movement of capital, of goods, of ideas, and yes, of people across frontiers. The migration piece of it, the people part of it, since 2011, has been the most controversial part. Um, by some estimates, we have more people on, uh, this is the, the period in, since World War II in which there have been more people moving across borders, being displaced, being moved, um, that we've had in recent history. For diverse causes, as you all well know, causes that include poverty, war, economic advancement, climate change, and increasingly a growing population imbalance that hasn't been noticed very much but that we need to pay attention to, being driven by demographic forces. This is occurring at the same time as the upheaval in communications and the social media revolution, which occurs at two levels. Through social media, we get to know more about other places, other countries. We get visions of a, a land where things can be very different for us, and that sets people on the move. But also there is the political effect that we've seen in the United States and we've seen in Europe as well. And that is through social media, people can directly mobilize people. You can turn politics, you can turn government, into a kind of a plebiscite, which is one step away, as we've seen in the US, an invitation to mob rule. So migration comes to us both as a result and a cause of a fundamental economic and social change that is occurring, but is poorly understood. There's a belief by my president and by other leaders that you can resolve these problems essentially through political means. I think that's a misreading of the nature of the change. And in that uh, singular personality that he has, Donald J. Trump has once again identified a problem that he then makes worse, a lot worse. Um, he has comrade in arms in Europe as well. I want to single out what 
the next stage of the economic revolution that Donald Trump sees that he's embarked on. A year ago, we talked very much about how Mr. Trump defines relations with other countries on the basis of a misunderstanding of trade deficits and how trade actually works. It has become clear quite recently to me that the Trump administration has, in fact, embarked on an effort to destroy the global supply chain that has fed so much of globalization, that has played such an important role in lifting billions of people out of poverty. If there, and this is allied to the Trump administration's effort to destroy the WTO. Um, if there's one thing that we could point at, or several things we could point at that would talk about the efficacy of global governance, I would nominate the global supply chain and WTO. Uh, but the United States is determined, or at least this administration, is determined to dismantle as much of those planks of go global governance as it can. Unfortunately, we're likely to wind up with a much more chaotic world as a result. The migration pressures that we've seen have driven populist victories, but I'm not sure we've seen populism and populist parties come up with the solutions to the pressures that created their victories. It's produced an unhealthy change in my country in the kind of debate um, that makes many people think that Trump follows a divide and rule strategy when it comes to dealing with the American people. And we've heard a description here today a little bit of the tensions that exist in Europe between Western European and Central European countries. And these are divisions that are not good for the EU and they go into the national fabric of so many countries. I want to touch briefly on the demographic factors that will cast quite a dark shadow in the future unless we take some actions to deal with them. It's well known that population growth in Russia and in Europe has stabilized. That's a euphemistic way of saying that, in fact, native-born population has been shrinking in Europe because of the fertility rate in Russia, largely because of life expectancy declines and an appalling health care situation. Now we have, in the United States quite recently, a new trend of uh, a drop in fertility rates among native-born Americans. Causes are not quite clear yet, but this could add to the kind of pressures that we're going to see um, in, uh, in Europe particularly coming from Africa. I was interested in doing a little research for this speech to see how controversial a subject population growth is. There are not that many studies on population growth, and they're very carefully written. President Macron of France discovered the same thing recently, discovered how sensitive this subject is when last year he was seen to be wagging his finger by asking African women, uh, whether or not, well, he suggested they chose to have seven or eight children rather than to get graduate degrees. This was announced at a minimum as inelegant and at its maximum somewhat racist. But it is a looming reality for Europe that Africa poses a population bomb because of the combination of poverty. Of the 25 countries with the highest total fertility rates, 23 are in Africa. Africa's population will triple between 2000 and 2050, going from roughly 800 million to roughly 2.4 billion. And most of those people, the large majority, will be living on less than $2 a day. Africa is also urbanizing quite rapidly. So the pressures of today will seem small compared to the pressures of tomorrow unless we begin to take action to prevent the new 
migration waves that are likely to come, particularly from Africa and the Middle East, where strife is still apparent, um, and Africa. The uh, combined effect uh, of these changes, including the social media, is the political polarization. We need to begin to construct media literacy as a component of civil education to make people understand what they can and cannot trust on social media. But that's just part of the problem that our generations face. One of the pleasures of being a journalist is that you occasionally, quite frequently actually, get to talk to very smart people, and particularly in politics. And one of the things I've noticed over the years in talking to people like Valerie Giscard d'Estaing, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Giovanni Napolitano and others was the emphasis they put to me on how my generation and the generations that came after are coming after was essentially untested. We had not lived through the Great Depression. We had not really been involved in World War II and that we hadn't proven ourselves. Well here is the chance to do that now, I think. This is the generation that will have to reinvent or at least redesign democracy, taking into account the pressures of a world in constant movement now and connected in ways that are both good and bad. So, Sean, I'll conclude there. Thank you, Jim. Let me circle back to one question for each of you. But please restrict yourselves to this question because I do want to open it up. Apart from anything else, everyone up here is actually on the receiving end of migrant flows. There are people in the audience who are on the delivery end of migrant flows. And I think it's important to bring that part into the discussion as well. But let me ask you this question. Jean-Francois started, I thought, <clears throat> with a very important observation. From the perspective of Europe, Jim has broadened that perhaps to the perspective of democracies, we have to find a collective solution to this problem. There has to be a European solution to the challenge of migration which challenge is going to rise for the demographic reasons described and the realities of the world that we live in. We have to find a European solution that takes account of individual circumstance within the European space. In the context of the United States, there has to be a US solution that takes account of the reality of its neighborhood as well. We cannot have polarization and division destroying the fabric of society <clears throat> and undermining the validity of democratic institutions profoundly. So what, this is the question, what do you think the key elements of a common solution would be to this particular challenge? Jean-Francois? Well, I think the first one could be to see what we can imagine as a European governance. The main problem that we do have to face today is that we have a huge difficulty to find a common path. Oh, the interests today between the member states are not aligned on these questions. We know that there is a danger for democracies. We see, of course, the rise of the extremists from the right wing and the left wing. Sometimes, as in Italy, they are able to unify themselves as a coalition of interest, not a coalition of ideas. That's why we are all worrying about what's going on in Italy. But this is because the traditional governing parties are not able today to find what could be a European governance. This is the first thing. The second thing is that we have to take into account the fact that we cannot always point the Europe, the European Union, as a scapegoat. Usually, the major part of the decisions 
could be made by the state members. The reality is here. Many of these problems of immigration has to be faced and addressed inside of our own countries. And my hope is that after the European elections of next June, we will uh, be fed up with the opposition between Mr. Orban and Mr. Macron and try to come back to a rational analysis. Maybe we can try to convince Mr. Macron to get into the popular European party, which would simplify the debates and make sure that we are able to find a common path. And then it will be my third point. No solution about immigration issues if we are not increasing the contribution to the development of countries who need it today. Of course, we have to monitor it, to share experience with countries from North Africa, even if Morocco is a remarkable model of this kind of cooperation, but also of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We hear this morning the Prime Minister of Ivory Coast. There are remarkable experiences that have been done in Africa. We have to be uh, beside them uh, because we have the tradition, the culture, the common points to do it with them, and this is a fantastic opportunity. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Laszlo, how much of that resonates with you? Merci. Merci beaucoup. Il me semble qu'il faut faire la différenciation entre les, entre les mots le réfugié et les migrants. Aujourd'hui, il y a quand même un amalgame quand nous parlons ces deux, tout le monde sont migrants, mais quand oui, même, dans mon pain, en tant que juriste, je préfère qu'il y ait des réfugiés, il y a les traités internationaux qu'il faut respecter, la Convention de Genève, il y a la Convention de Dublin, en Europe, là-bas, c'est clair. La migration, c'est une autre chose. Et là-bas, je pense que chez les politiciennes, souvent, on parle ensemble ces deux mots. Pour moi, personnellement, c'est très important de faire la différenciation. Un côté. En ce qui concerne les réfugiés, il faut un accord commun. C'est sûr et certain. Parce que les réfugiés, à la base, il faut traiter, il faut dialoguer, dialoguer, dialoguer. Jusqu'à la fin, nous trouvons la solution. Et bien sûr, là-bas, il y a plein d'idées que nous n'avons pas réussi. Le système de quotas. Le système de quotas qui est mort dans la réalité parce que c'est un success story euh, en Europe. Parce que nous savons très bien que les gens veulent habiter en Germanie ou je ne sais pas en Suède, mais pas en Roumanie, en Bulgarie ou en Roumanie ou en Hongrie, etc. etc. Alors c'est la raison pour laquelle il y avait des efforts de la part des chefs d'État et le Premier ministre qui n'a pas réussi dans la réalité. Et la question se pose, est-ce qu'il existe un, un seul euh, type de solidarité où il y a différents types de solidarité de la part des États membres. Est-ce que nous donnons pour les États membres certaines flexibilités Alors, comment réagir concernant notamment la migration qu'il faut aider Je suis tout à fait d'accord avec M. Copé, qu'il faut aller sur place, qu'il faut aider. À la base, il faut organiser aussi de différents meetings et je pense que c'est indispensable. Permettez que je parle... C'est vraiment mon être personnel que je suis professeur à l'université, j'ai 60 étudiants qui viennent d'Afrique de l'Ouest, qui parlent parfaitement français, mais qui viennent de Sénégal, Togo, etc., différents pays. Il faut organiser différentes manières, alors, ce type de solidarité. La solidarité aussi, si nous protégeons un pays qui dispose de la frontière extérieure de l'Union européenne, qui fait la protection, elle est contribuable qui paye ça. Alors, je, je pense que c'est très important. Permettez que je parle deux mots concernant le populisme. La Hongrie était souvent mentionnée comme populiste, et c'est la raison pour laquelle je pense qu'il faut que je prenne la parole autour de ça. Comme Giscard d'Estaing a mentionné à M. Mitterrand que, M. Mitterrand, vous ne disposez pas le monopole de cœur. Alors, ça signifie aussi quand même qu'il faut être très prudent quand nous parlons que le populisme. Quand il y a quelqu'un qui a une autre idée, une autre vision, qui veut participer dans le dialogue, Partis de Léo, souvent reçoit un emblème, un label que, euh, populiste. C'est la raison pour laquelle je suis très prudent quand de dire que populiste, parce que quand même la notion de populiste est devenue tellement large aujourd'hui que tout le monde peut devenir populiste dans un moment, s'il n'est pas d'accord avec quelque chose. Alors c'est la raison pour laquelle je pense que quand nous parlons autour de ça, le populisme, en même temps, c'est être quand même, je pense que c'est très important, le dialogue. C'est la seule chose que je crois. Alors, le dialogue avec les différents États, avec la Hongrie, avec la Pologne, avec les autres pays. 
Mais quand même, si nous étions mentionnés sur autre pays, sur les populistes, ce ne facilite pas le dialogue. C'est la raison pour laquelle je, sais, je, veux, je voulais mentionner que quand même c'est un élément très très important. Et l'autre côté, je pense qu'en ce qui concerne la migration, est-ce qu'un pays veut quand même accueillir les migrants, pas réfugiés, migrants, là-bas il faut donner la liberté des États aussi. Merci beaucoup. Bogdan. The answer to your question is very simple, but also very challenging. The answer is that we need more solidarity. Solidarity, and again solidarity, is uh, the, only, uh, the only idea that we can uh, try to impl that implementing which we can defend our values. Those values that are not only written and incorporated into the treaties. But it is important to remember that the European Union in the Article 2 of the Lisbon Treaty has the list of those values, as well as the Washington Treaty that is still the base of uh, the alliance, has the list of those values in the preamble of, uh, of that uh, short treaty. This is the rule of law. This is the respect for human rights and civil liberties, the democracy, free market, etc., etc. So we know what we, f what we should defend. But we need more international solidarity, defending uh, those values in those countries that they are threatened right now and they, that, that can be threatened in the uh, in future. As for the European Union, because, uh, because the answer of the European Union is absolutely crucial absolutely crucial for itself and for the future of, uh, of Europe, I would recommend uh, using existing uh, uh, tools last, like uh, PESCO. We are talking about that in Marrakesh uh, last year. Fortunately, there was a good decision to introduce PESCO as one of the tools of the European Union that existed for years but was not introduced before. But it is necessary also to uh, create a new asylum policy. It is also necessary to reinforce the control of the borders of the European Union with much deeper, much reinforced uh, uh, involvement of uh, Frontex agency. It is also in, uh, absolutely in, uh, uh, crucial to reinforce the neighborhood policy not only in southern, but also in eastern dimension of neighborhood policy. How the neighborhood policy can exist for, could exist for years it, uh, when it had at its disposal only 10.2 billion euros. It has to be financially reinforced in the new multi-annual perspective of the European Union. And finally, I would say we should fight together against those who dismantle the system of checks and balances as well as the respect for human and civil rights. Thank you indeed. And Jim, you have the last word until the audience. Sean, being a Francophile notoire, my answer is divided into three parts. Um, the first part is to begin to treat this migration problem as having important, substantial economic factors involved in it. Uh, in the first place, recognize that uh, shrinking populations mean that immigration is a way to replenish the workforce, rather than uh, pretending that you can make yourself great again without people um, by shutting off immigration, uh, which is the primary source of population growth in the United States right now. Uh, the economic problem also extends to not messing up the world's trade system that has brought so many people out of poverty. Um, because the more you can get people to earn their livings where they are now, the less likely they are to leave and try to come to other places. So we need an economic approach to this. We also need to treat migration as a humanitarian crisis. Not a problem, but a crisis, because it is at crisis stages now. And much of what we hear um, tends to not treat it uh, with the urgency that it demands. 
And the third and final point that I would make is that we need to acknowledge honestly, our politicians need to acknowledge honestly the cultural differences, the cultural and social problems that immigration or migration creates and to stop exploiting migration for the purpose of dividing people and making people afraid. Jim, thank you. I think the issue is well framed. I can see one, two, three, four hands. And as we have some degree of gender balance, two men, two women, I'm afraid I'm going to have to limit it to that. We have exactly 10 minutes left. Each of you, please identify yourselves and phrase the question crisply. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. Microphones up here, if you would. Can you get one microphone to the front row over here and one to the front row over there? And Ladies then you first. chaps will pass on, but you'll be honest and pass to the people who had their hands up first. Right, shoot. Merci. Monsieur Leishoubi, euh, académicien, chercheur, ancien ministre algérien. Il, il, il y a des, des débats qui, qui par l'image, rappellent des préoccupations. Si vous me permettez une métaphore, euh, les gens qui fabriquent les, les lunettes, le lunetier, l'oculiste, a eu souvent des problèmes. Faut-il fabriquer des lunettes pour voir de près Faut-il fabriquer des lunettes pour voir de loin Parce qu'en même temps, l'humain, il a besoin de voir de près et de loin et finalement, il a fabriqué des lunettes euh, progressives qui lui permettent de voir et de près et de loin. Et donc, euh, la première petite conclusion, c'est qu'il faut éviter sur des sujets complexes d'avoir une vision de trop près, une vision réductrice. C'est pour ça que je m'associe à la dernière euh, intervention. Je, je me permets de souligner que j'ai une expérience particulière puisque j'ai été dans le panel des médiateurs pour le conflit du nord du Mali et du nord du Niger, et que la question subsaharienne, je la, je la connais pour l'avoir et gérée et investiguée. Alors, les élites de tous ces pays du, du Sahel se posent un, un ensemble de questions qui, qui ont été résumées, que je reprends assez euh, rapidement. C'est vrai que la migration a plusieurs origines, climat, emploi et questions géopolitiques. Les déstabilisations ont été évoquées et là on ne peut pas euh, timidement, prudemment, gentiment se dire qu'on n'a aucune responsabilité. Maintenant les questions climatiques et les questions économiques sont aussi évidentes. Faut-il globaliser mais pas globaliser Faut-il avoir une prétention universelle mais pas universelle Globaliser, alors là on se préoccupe de structurer l'économie mondiale et demander à la Chine de corriger ses déficits et on est totalement dans ce débat. Et quand on est dans un certain nombre de pays sur les questions, notamment subsahariennes, on a une présence du capital, mais qui n'a aucune responsabilité sur la structuration. Et donc il y a, à mon sens, des questions de fond qu'on ne peut pas éviter. Croire qu'il y a des économies nationales ou régionales comme européennes est un vain mot que l'on n'a rien compris à l'économie mondiale, à ses mutations, à ses évolutions. Il n'est plus possible d'avoir des dessins ou des projets économiques Merci sans beaucoup, avoir une, pour, une vision ouverte. Merci à vous. Madame Oui. Carrie Halfordy Hardy, American citizen, résident en France and above all Texan, um, which is, leads to my question. There is a, an amalgam between border security and immigration that I think is not correctly teased out in these discussions. For example, in Texas, we have a lot of immigration that's quite successful. Houston is the most, uh, is the most diverse city in America, still has a very good quality of life and a very good economic growth. But there's a lot of questions of border security, obviously with, um, with Mexican drug gangs, etc. And that's a legitimate issue. And it, it even touches on people who are immigrants themselves to America. So if you could address that, that teasing a part of those two issues, I'd appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much. Behind you over there. Just wait. Oui, bonjour. Riata Bertulibon. 
parler du multiculturalisme euh, ne peut pas se faire sans évoquer le Liban. Le Liban a 18 communautés qui vivent ensemble depuis des siècles à travers la compréhension du fait que la liberté de chaque communauté s'arrête à la liberté de l'autre. On a trouvé un système consensuel de démocratie pluraliste qui fonctionne. Le Liban est le pays de ce fait le plus stable dans une région qui est au feu et au sang. Ce qu'il y a, c'est que, c'est une réflexion qui se fait, la, euh, le, la charte universelle des droits de l'homme n'est pas reconnue par tout le monde. Pour l'organisation des pays islamiques, la charte n'est acceptable que dans la mesure où elle n'est pas en contradiction avec la charia. Alors, il en ressort un sujet de réflexion qu'on est en train de mener au Liban, c'est de travailler sur une charte universelle des valeurs communes des valeurs communes aux différentes religions et aux différentes cultures. Et dans ce sens, le Liban souhaite créer une académie pour justement étudier ce problème de la charte des valeurs communes et un dossier dans ce sens a été déposé aux Nations Unies pour la création de ce centre. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Oui, madame Yes, uh, Asiya Ibn Salah Alawi, Ambassador at Large of His Majesty. I would like just to make a couple of comments very brief and ask a question to our European panelist. First of all, I think that there is a very urgent necessity to reframe the debate. There is no real invasion, you know, for Europe per se, even if I'm aware that there is very little appetite for migrants in Europe. However, we are not in the figures of 2015 very far from that. So to my mind, focusing so much on migration is creating more divides within the European societies, between the European countries, and between the two realms. More than that, it is cannibalizing the whole relations between the two realms. And we have no time to speak about any other thing except migration. So my question, do you think that by pushing European borders, and someone has been talking about borders, simply to the southern partners, namely North Africa, fragilizing this very shield against so many things, including insecurity, against extremism, against uh, terrorism, like in Morocco, fragilizing the Tunisian uh, democracy, which is still very young. Do you think that this is durable solutions, which is very far morally unaccepted, far from the European values, and it does not answer, it does not bring durable solutions to migration, which I remind you is going to increase tremendously. It's not going to stop, it's not going to decrease. On the contrary, you will have to find durable solutions. So Mr. Poke, uh, Cope was saying that there is no European solutions. Unfortunately, there is one stand which agrees on then we have to put centers in North Africa and we are offering platform de débarquement for the migrants. This is unacceptable and it doesn't bring durable solutions to the problem. We have to discuss all together and I hope that during the occasion of the compact about durable migration which is going to take place in my country in Marrakech, we can find some constructive solutions to a human problem as Jim Hogland said. And I would like to remind you to finish what the Swiss playwright said. We have asked for workers and we got human beings. And this is the problem of migration because European policy have always been restrictive, not integrative. Thank you very much. Well, the wonderful thing about this, I apologize to everyone. The clock is unfortunately my master. There's no time for anything except a response from the panel. 
<coughs> and I'm going to ask the panel, I apologize, Minister, I apologize sincerely. The problem is the clock is the master. Now, I, I'm going to ask each one of you, please, to pick a question to which to respond. And please respond as effectively and as quickly as you can so that we do not delay the next panel. Jean-François. Je, je voudrais répondre en français. Parce que j'ai beaucoup entendu d'anglais. Il faut que je, quand même, j'entendais mon ami parler français bon. remarquablement. J'ai eu un petit moment quand même de, de regret. Je voudrais répondre, Madame l'Ambassadrice, euh, à votre intervention à la fois brillante et un peu tonique. Euh, je voulais vous dire la chose suivante à propos de la question de l'immigration. Il ne faut pas reprocher aux responsables politiques de parler d'immigration. Si nous en parlons en Europe, c'est parce que les gens nous en parlent et qu'on ne peut pas d'un côté redouter ce qu'on appelle à tort les populistes. Ce n'est pas le bon mot. Le bon mot, c'est extrémiste. Il n'y a pas ceux qui sont au milieu du peuple et ceux qui ne le sont pas. Ça, c'est des visions théoriques. Je suis maire d'une des villes les plus pauvres d'Île-de-France de, depuis des années. Tout en étant à droite, ce sont mes habitants, ils votent à gauche au national, et ils votent pour un homme de droite ou, sur le plan local. Pourquoi Tout simplement parce qu'ils votent pour quelqu'un qui essaie de régler les problèmes. Le vrai sujet pour nous, c'est de trouver les meilleures solutions à chaque fois. Or, sur la question de l'immigration, il faut mettre de côté l'idéologie, il faut mettre de côté les bons sentiments, d'un côté comme de l'autre. Et il faut, de manière pragmatique, n'avoir qu'un objectif, réussir le parcours d'intégration de celui qui vient en Europe. Sinon, ça n'est pas un succès pour personne. Les tensions, aujourd'hui, sont énormes. Si on veut éviter que ce soit les extrémistes qui prennent le pouvoir et qui alors apporte les pires des solutions, nous n'avons, nous, d'autre choix que d'avoir une solution qui soit nationale, européenne, et qui se fasse en partenariat avec tous les pays qui sont, eux aussi, à l'extérieur de l'Europe, concernés par cela, avec de l'aide au développement partagée, avec des hotspots organisés, avec des partenariats, mais aussi avec une fermeté qui fasse la différence entre ceux qui vont réussir leur parcours parce qu'ils en ont la possibilité, et ceux qui ne le pourront pas. Et un dernier point, je reviens sur ce qui a été dit tout à l'heure à juste raison, il faut séparer ce qui relève de la demande d'asile de réfugiés qui fuient les pays en guerre et auxquels nous devons l'accueil, parce que c'est notre responsabilité que de le faire, et ceux qui viennent pour d'autres raisons et pour lesquelles nous devons avoir une vision beaucoup plus stricte, parce que nous ne pouvons pas réussir leur intégration. C'est ça qui est en jeu, c'est extraordinairement difficile, et de grâce, n'opposons pas les gentils et les méchants. On essaie de faire du mieux qu'on peut et on ne peut pas, et ce sera ma dernière remarque, le comparer avec la situation américaine. J'entendais tout à l'heure ce que vous disiez à propos des États-Unis. Il n'y a rien de comparable entre les enjeux migratoires aux États-Unis et les enjeux migratoires en Europe. Il y a la frontière mexicaine, c'est un gros problème, je n'en doute pas, mais l'Europe elle est au carrefour de beaucoup de choses et il est aujourd'hui beaucoup plus facile de franchir les frontières européennes que les, fr que les frontières américaines. Merci. Laszlo. Merci. Merci beaucoup. C'est seulement une statistique concernant les frontières que depuis 1988, plus de 28 000 km de nouvelles frontières internationales ont été instituées et que 24 000 autres ont fait l'objet d'accords de délimitation ou la démarcation. Le Crimée, et je peux encore continuer. Alors ça signifie que les frontières, quand même, se jouent aujourd'hui une question très chaude. Et bien sûr, le passage sur les frontières aussi reste très chaud, mais n'oublions pas qu'en Europe, quand même, la coopération de Schengen quand même, dispose d'un élément très important. Et nous, je pense que pas seulement nous les Hongrois, mais pour toutes les Européennes, c'est une valeur. Quand je veux expliquer à mes enfants quelle est la, valeur, la plus grande valeur européenne, que je peux prendre la voiture, et je peux aller de Budapest jusqu'à Paris, sans aucune frontière, sans aucune contre-frontière, c'est déjà un élément. Et je pense que c'est l'Europe. Il faut montrer les valeurs européennes en pratique. Et s'il n'y a pas de frontières extérieures dans la réalité, alors dans ce cas, il aura fragilisé le, 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 le code de Schengen. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle le code de Schengen, c'est très raison. Et deux mots, seulement un petit mot, le Liban, parce que je suis souvent euh, professeur invité à l'Université Saint-Joseph à Beyrouth. Vous avez tout à fait raison que nous oublions souvent le Liban et le problème de Liban. J'ai visité un camp de réfugiés vraiment la frontière de, de Syrie, et là-bas, je vois quelles difficultés existent là-bas. Elles helpent vraiment à l'aide pour le Liban. 
C'est vraiment une obligation morale de la communauté internationale. Merci beaucoup, Bogdan. Unfortunately, in Europe, Madame Ambassador, we have a much longer list of problems, not only migration. Migration is, of course, uh, one of the main challenges for uh, European unity, but this is not the only one. So this list is really very, very long, and it is uh, uh, expressed in current negotiations concerning the future uh, multi-annual financial uh, perspective for seven next years of the European Union. And the cooperation between the European Union and the Maghreb uh, uh, countries, mainly with uh, Morocco, includes uh, also not only migration as the main, uh, as main issues. I'm in a good situation as a rapporteur of the Council of Europe concerning Morocco, because I can say here in this chamber that this list of uh, our joint achievements between Europe and Morocco is really a long one. There are still challenges existing, but uh, in the case of the rule of law, in the case of implementation of organic uh, laws, those that were um, uh, 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 in, uh, written in the constitution of Morocco, we have, you have successes, and we accelerated this process. We are aware in Europe that it is necessary absolutely to reinforce the common security and defense policy. We are also aware that it's in, it is necessary to enhance common foreign and security policy to avoid the situation like happened in, uh, in Ukraine after 2014, that the European Union was not active in this space, in this space uh, after the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea by Russian Federation and after the European order that emerged after the, after the Cold War was blown up by the aggression of, uh, military aggression of Russian Federation. European Union was, uh, was absent uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in those negotiations. Yeah? So we are completely convinced that the reinforcement of CFSP is crucial as, uh, as well. And we have also other areas in which cooperation between uh, you, I mean our southern and eastern neighborhood and European Union's countries is themselves is absolutely crucial. One of them is, terror is counter-terrorism. One of them is counter-terrorism. Without uh, good channel of communication without the practical cooperation, we will not be able to, to deal with this uh, dramatic uh, challenge for, for both uh, for neighborhood and for the European Union itself. Well done, so thank you. We're on the again, future. the list is much longer, although migration is one of the crucial issues. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Sorry, but as everyone knows, we're out of time. Jim, as crisply as you can. A brief comment to reinforce two views we heard from the floor. Uh, I share with my co-citizen um, the concern about border security, and I think uh, all the help we can give to the Border Patrol, to ICE, to uh, ensure that border screening is efficient uh, is a good idea. Um, I think it's possible to do that without indicting an entire country as rapists and bad hombres as the ambassador from Morocco has suggested. I think talking about immigration as we have here this afternoon is a contribution, and I hope IFRI continues to do so. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to close with one simple statement. We've opened a discussion here. I think we've opened it well. I think that what was said by different panelists reflecting different perspectives, and particularly the feedback from the floor is an indication of how difficult this issue is and how critically important it is that this debate be extended, deepened, and carried forward. If it is not resolved, if the solutions to these problems are not found, we are literally sowing the wind and will reap the whirlwind. Let us ensure that we use this as a point of departure with everyone involved 
in order to take this forward in a constructive way. Thank you very much to the panelists.